there's a little lag, but it basically reads. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you guys go to cwharris.com, you can see this live and use it yourself. That's fine. Um, and if you're on a touch enabled device, multi touch enabled device, you'll get a distinct line for each finger you can drag across the screen. Um, and that's part of what I'm going to be showing you tonight. All right, so, <coughs> so basically, uh, what's happening here is when I press down on the screen, I'm selecting all of the moves up until I release. And that's pretty much what my code says. Okay? Like, literally, there's a few lines that say just that. I'll get to that in a second. So, what happens is when I press down, there's a big red circle that comes up around it. And then, 350 milliseconds later, another red circle appears. And what that represents is when I start, when I press down, a red circle appears because I've started tapping in a certain area. And I can keep on tapping. And it groups, it groups those taps by its location until a release and that red circle appears. So that second red circle represents that group of taps um, ending. So the first red circle says, hey, tap group started. And then the second one says, hey, it ended. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. OK, sorry. When we drag this around, there's another object distinctly that exists from the point where we press to the point where we release. OK, so it's just an example. Think about it to <laughs> my presentation now. Oh, cool. <laughs> So you actually have multi on a multi-touch device. You actually have multiple finger touches. Yeah. So we're. I mean, I can't really demonstrate it on here. If anybody's got a screen they want to show, it crashed. But it cool. It crashed. What, what are you using? <laughs> no, it must no. be on there. <laughs> right. So um, yes, yeah, so it works for all of your fingers just simply. So you can put three fingers on the screen, drag it across, you'll get three lines. All right. So let's let's go ahead and get going. Some kind of ways to do Okay, so what is functional reactive programming? Okay. Let's break it down. Programming. We all know what programming is. We're telling the computer what to do, right? That's pretty straightforward. Who here has done programming? Cool. Everybody's done programming. What about reactive programming? Does anyone know what reactive programming is by that name? Other than the people that I've told about it. Okay, so all of you, are, have you done JavaScript at all? Have you handled a click input via JavaScript? Yep. Okay, you've done reactive programming. It's that simple. What yes. is that difference between event-driven programming? So it's the same thing as event-driven programming? Basically, yes. It is, it's exactly the same. The reason why I'm calling it reactive is because I'm talking in terms of functional reactive programming. So event-driven programming, functional, or reactive programming, basically the same thing. Okay. Then we have functional programming. Um, has anyone here heard of functional programming? Big buzzword right now. Okay, have you guys done functional programming? A little bit of functional programming over here, over there. Okay, functional reactive programming. So, reactive programming or functional programming is us defining new things using functions in terms of other things that already exist, where none of those things that are already defined change. Right. So, so okay. Let me. Yeah. Let me, uh, yeah. So. In the past, I've created programs where I have fields, and then based on new data, it gives me new data. Yes. Right? So that's functional programming, right? Well, in functional programming, nothing changes. So when we assign a value, say we say A is 5, okay. A will always be 5. Right. B, 10. B will always be 10. Okay. C equals A plus B. That means C is going to be 15. But that's not what C is. C is A plus 5. So if in the case A or B did change, which it doesn't, I'll get to it in a second, C would change. C would react to the changes of A and B. I'll get it. We'll get into code here in a second. Okay, so sure. functional reactive programming. The, the actual process of writing a computer program to act in response to a situation relating to a variable quantity whose value depends on one or more other variables, or what? That makes no <laughs> sense. Okay? Like, I know you guys are totally lost right now, right? So seriously though, what? Completely <laughs> lost. Like I know you guys are lost. Okay, I'm forgetting this. So let's see a reactive code example. All right. So reactive code. This is some reactive code. First, I need to show you what it does. Otherwise, we're going to be even more lost. Okay. So we will end this gun and. Okay, we 
clicks. And I keep on clicking, and nothing's happening. That's cool. Let's see how that code works out. All right, so we have n equals zero, right? Well, let's, let's, start, let's start from the beginning, right? We go all the way to the bottom to get to the, begin to the beginning of what's happening here. We subscribe to a click event, and we give it this function, reaction, okay? Reaction, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna log a click event, it's gonna increment n, and then if n is greater than or equal to three, we're going to stop listening to the clicks. All right, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So one, two, three, we're not listening anymore, okay? But look how scattered that code is. The bottom is where we're, the first thing that we're, we talked about. And then we worked our way up. And we've got all of this state that we have to manage as well, so we've got an n up here, okay? So this is just an example of reactive programming. Um, some complex stuff we do. Can stop for a second. Um, guys, this is my first presentation in a large group of people, so I'm a little bit nervous. I want you to let you know that. I have something important to tell you guys that I'm trying to get across uh, in a way that's starting out in layman's terms and moving way up. And um, if this is totally boring, I will be offended if you guys get up and walk out. That's totally cool. But I promise by the end of this, you'll find it interesting. Or if you don't, I'll give you guys free pizza or something. <laughs> um, so reactive. One, something happens. Two, you react to it. Click, and then we log the console that you clicked, right? Okay. Use this for reactive programming, include user input, server responses, time-based operations, <coughs> complex, all of you guys can read that. But the key is you don't know when it's going to happen. It's happening at some point in the future. Okay? So a click. You may be prepared to handle it, but it's not happening right now. You don't have those yet. Okay? We can't have an array of the clicks, can we? Like it's impossible to have an array of all the clicks that will happen in your application, right? Okay, that's the point of reactive programming. And so we don't know what's going to happen, so we have to react to it. So let's look at an example of functional programming. So functional programming, right? Let's go back over here. So it'll start to get interesting in just a minute, I promise. Functional programming. So we're defining, we're using functions to define things in terms of things that already exist where nothing changes, right? So numbers is a list of one through five. Squares is the numbers squared. Cubes is the numbers cubed, and sum is the numbers summed. We're not doing any looping here to try and create these new lists. We're just saying this is equal to the squares of those. Okay? Now internally, we're going to have to do some looping over that list, and we're going to have to process it in a certain way to get all that information. But what's important here is that we can describe it as cubes equals numbers cubed. And we can see the result down here. The way we would do that in JavaScript is just like this. Numbers dot math. So let me show you, if we were to do this without would loop over existing stuff. I is less than numbers not laying. I plus plus. Right. And then we would get the current number. And then we would push that new number. Okay. Time itself. This is a lot of code that can happen off by one error. Um, we're also making sure that it happens right here and now happen in the future. Um, like if we wanted to do this specifically for click events in the future, we can't use this code. We can't map over things that haven't happened yet. Right? That's where functional reactive programming comes in. Helps us use functional programming aspects in a reactive world. Okay? So to do to map over this we have a function called map, right? And this is this works right now. So we've got numbers already. And then we want to map numbers to squares. So squares is now going to equal that original array, but each element is squared, right? So what happens? What happens if it clicks? Do we wait until three clicks happen and store up those clicks and then process them? What if we had like 100 clicks? We have to sit there and wait for someone to enter 100 clicks before we can map this stuff out, right? No, we want them to use functional array for, but Uses for functional programming, all this, we don't need to worry about that right now. So like I said, functional programming happens when we use a function to define things in terms of other things where existing things don't change. So this house C is not changing. So in this case, plus is the function. Okay. 
So when a computer thinks don't change, like in functional programming, it's going to get boring. So we need things to change. But how do we represent change in an environment where we can't change existing things? Right? That's functional reactive. So we combine them. Right? We combine functional <laughs> with reactive. Okay? So, which, are, which sound opposite. Functional stuff doesn't change. Reactive stuff changes all the time. We combine those. Bad things happen, right? Well, that's where code gets confusing, is where we try to mix that thing together. All right. So, functional reactive code example. This is the first, this is the first thing I can show you, functional reactive. So this is a roll your own. This is not reactive extensions yet, all right? So, I'm going to get rid of the stuff that's not important here. Here we go. So, like I said, before we had A, or C equals A plus B. We want to represent that without actually changing anything. Okay? We can do that by defining a thing, a thing that changes, and another thing that changes. Those are A and B. And then we can define the dependent thing. The dependent thing depends on A and B. It is a composition of A and B in a certain way. And it takes this function as well, right? This function defines what C is. C equals A plus B. Okay? Down here we are subscribing to the changes of each A. Every time A changes, we flash the class alter. Um, it should be alert, but whatever. And then we change the value to whatever the current value of A is. Is that making sense? Everybody following? <coughs> okay. Not following? Everybody raise your hand. Okay, if you are not following, lower your hand. Okay, <laughs> hey, we're not following. Do we have any, does anybody have any questions thus far as to what's going on here? No, okay. So we've got two things and a dependent thing that depends on the other two things. So let's see this in action. This is, this is eye candies. Hopefully you guys will enjoy this a little bit more. Okay. A is on the left, or A is, C equals A plus B, we've got A plus B equals C. Okay, so we're changing A, we're changing B, and then C is reactively updating, functionally and reactively updating. So we have this object that represents the future changes of C. They haven't happened yet, but we know they're going to happen. We don't assign a variable C to number five, and then later reassign the value 15 to C, and then call a function that says, hey, C was updated, everybody, let's do some state management and try and figure out what all we need to do because C changed. Okay? We just listen to the fact that C changed in the first place. We start programming by knowing that C is going to change in the future and reacting every time C changes. Should I get what I mean? That's a C change. <laughs> That's a C change. For instance, if we were going to if we were going to write this differently, okay, let's say var a equals five, var b equals ten, and then var c equals fifteen, right? Well, if we change A equals 10, now we've got to say, oh, and by the way, C equals, sorry, let me scoot back here. <coughs> C needs to update again, right? Oh, and by the way, because we don't have any way of notifying everybody who had C that it's changed, we need to call some function called, hey guys, C changed. This is the difference between functional reactive programming and imperative programming. Okay. If we have one location defined for a single variable that we know is going to change over time, and then we change it, whoever is subscribed to that variable getting the latest update will automatically know how that's working. Okay. Who's, who's heard of knockout.js? You guys have heard of not knockout.js? Let me show you how big the code base is for knockout.js. Okay. Have you guys seen? I'm not knocking Knockout. Knockout is cool. Um, and in fact, they just released um, some extensions for Visual Studio. Um, the, what's it called? The Web Essentials and stuff? Um, you can, yeah, Web Developer Platform. Yeah, it's the Web Developer Platform um, Web Essentials stuff. And you can actually, it's got integration with Visual Studio into Knockout. So you can like click on your views <laughs> and the Knockout templates and all that stuff. Um, I have a quick question for yes. you. Uh, just more <coughs> detail on that last one. What was causing A and B to change of that? Why have you asked that? So I've got some code down here that I'm hiding from you, which is all this stuff, which is actually what's causing the changes. Okay. But I can show you how to represent those changes using reactive extensions in just a single line that looks a lot more functional. Like we 
obviously have some state management going on down here. <coughs> We're changing values and then updating that stuff. Um, but React extensions helps us hide that or source it from the change of value on an input, things like that. Uh, okay, um, I won't go into I won't go into knockout. Basically, knockout code base is huge. Okay, it's a pretty simple concept. We have MDVM DOM binding. So anytime a value changes, we propagate that change to everybody who's listening, right? Okay, its code base is very, very large. Um, the reason why its code base is so large is not because it has all these cool things that it can do, like it's got its custom extensions and whatnot, that's fine. The reason it's so large is, is because it has, a, it has a dependency tracker built into it, okay? So it's figuring out when you change things and trying to notify everyone else. So it gives you this really cool interface where you can program your H or you can write your HTML to bind to something. But behind the scenes, it's got a huge code base trying to figure out how to notify everybody and like keep everybody in sync. And we're using reactive extensions, which I've done this. I was able to get a lot of the knockout, the knockout functionality working in about four to five hundred lines of Rx. Okay, let me show you that real quick. <coughs> I'm not saying that's awesome because React Rx um, obviously has a lot more time going into it. This is calls the bash. Okay. There we go. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but I'm trying to trying to keep you guys interested in this. It's failing miserably. I'm terribly sorry. Who did you go to find? Okay. It's being great. Okay, cool. So we've got a value binder. We can see the source code for this right here. Okay, so we've got a, well, most of that markup is just Twitter bootstrap, ignore most of the markup. The stuff that's important is this data dash flash stuff. And it looks very, very similar to Knockout's bindings. So the source is name, and we want to change, we want to notify a source of the change of value every time the key goes up, okay? So on key up, change source, or on next source, make sure source changes, right? And then this is what we end up with. Try to type slower so you can yeah, see. It's not like it's that. delayed. And it is behind by one, but that's because we're responding to it on the key press, right? Mm -hmm. Here's when the key press and change. So also when I tab out, it's going to change. What about after key down? Okay, so the key goes down. It hasn't actually registered the change yet, but we delay that by zero milliseconds. We pick it up after that happens, after it's already propagated to the to the input and then we notify our bales. So by writing this that <coughs> flash, saying the value is source, or the value source is name, all these guys are gonna get synced up to each other, just like in Knockout, okay? But with way less code. And not because I'm knocking Knockout, but because mm -hmm. Reactive Extensions is really reusable. So it's doing a lot of the stuff that Knockout's doing, but in a push-based manner, rather than a pull-based manner, which I'm totally like jacking up. So no, you're not. So um, I'm I'm showing my ignorance a little bit here. But what is blur? When you blur, when whenever you when it loses focus, like the text box, you're not clicked inside it anymore. Yeah. So oh, I see. If I type right in here or move around or click anything, but as soon as I whoop, bounce. So like as soon as once I you mouse out that. of or deselect the elements. So like when you click on an input or something, that focuses, right? But then when we unclick or we click something else, the thing that went out of focus. Becomes blurry, it's blur. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Are all of these two way bindings like knockouts? Or they yeah, one it's two way bindings. So it's using something called a behavior subject. Right. Yes. So uh, I'm more of a Java programmer than a JS. They've got observable to the listeners. Yep. It's so what about that in JavaScript? And I mean, that instead of trying to figure out what happens, just set up observable to the listeners. That's what Reactive Extensions is for? Yes. So right. Reactive Extensions is. Observables plus link for anybody who knows .NET um, language integrated query, and then schedulers. You just said this <coughs> um, that it's uh, push base versus pull base. Yes. And the first time you told me that, I, I didn't quite get it, but I think that's the key difference. Yeah. Obser I'm assuming observables in Java work the same as a as a I notify property changed in .NET, but that would be a pull base system. So if a value changed, then an event is raised that says the value changed. It doesn't send the new value with that event. It just says the value changed. 
So the subscriber says, oh, the value changed, and then they go reread the value. And so they're, pu they're pulling the value mm -hmm. out when they get notified. But the push, and you might be getting deeper into this later, but yeah. the push is the new value just goes in. It, right. It's not kind of that two-step process. Right. I don't want to get you guys excited because I'm not going to talk about WebSockets, but everybody knows what WebSockets is, mm -hmm. sort of. Okay, so WebSockets, we connect, and it pushes us information straight to the browser. We don't set there refreshing stuff or setting timeouts to go pull information ever so often. And then, you know, we send a request maybe six times and it only updated once. We're wasting bandwidth, we're wasting time, we're wasting processing power, right? If it had a, it had a way of just sending us the data when it had new stuff, like, it just pushed it to us, it'd be a lot more efficient. So SlideShare could use your program. Probably, not my programming, but reactive schedule. Well, reactive, it, SlideShare, you know, updates based on views, right? Uh, so uh, I don't know, SlideShare.net is where people post presentations, mm -hmm. but it only updates an hour or however long based on, I haven't figured out why. Right, I mean, they could use WebSockets in JavaScript to get that done, but right. reactive extensions helps us do that in a way where it's much more legible and we're not doing state management. I'm gonna, there's, there's something I want to get to sure. here, okay? So um, this kind of just shows you the power of what's actually happening behind the scenes. So we can type in here our HTML changes, right? It's actually just injecting this HTML up there, right? Um, I can actually add styles and whatnot here, and it would affect the entire page. But there's click buttons. We've got two-way bindings, so I can knock out. But remember, the key difference here is that it's push-based, not pool-based. And we're not tracking the things that are changing. We're just instantly being notified that things did change. Um, functions and whatnot. OK, back to the presentation. OK, so I think I got ahead of myself, so I'm going to jump. So we combined them. Yay. It's a follow up for this image. And the presentation of combining the things that don't change with things that change. And then, oh, you've done it. OK, cool. Um, so functional reactive. Check this out. This is what this is some this is some React extensions, right? So it looks kind of similar at the top to what we did before with reactive stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But instead of adding a callback, we're just invoking a function. It's returning as a value, or an object, an observable. Okay? Then we can use some chain, so everybody's familiar with chain, like map, like we did before. Except in this case, map isn't working on stuff that exists, it's working on stuff that will come to us in the future via that observable. And then we subscribe to those clicks. So in this, we're taking all the clicks that were on the body, we're mapping them so we get an object that just has an X, X and Y properties, okay? But we pull that out of the event, page X and page Y. Then clicks, that variable there, represents all of the future clicks that, but automatically mapped to, or not automatically, but mapped to just an X, Y property object. And then we can subscribe to those and print them, okay? This is, this right here, this, this is the important stuff that I haven't gotten to yet. This. Everything up to this point has just been set to explain what it's, what's actually happening, which maybe I shouldn't have done, okay? But this map, this is asynchronous, okay? Those clicks are gonna happen in the future. That map is asynchronous, okay? Reactive, top and the bottom, functional in the middle. If only we've defined clicks, and then we're subscribing to clicks, but clicks never actually change. Clicks represent all of the future clicks, all of them. It's a list that doesn't end. Okay. Um, so what just happened? We use functions, constructors to find new things in terms of existing things without changing the existing things. The things we cr created represented the changes. So we don't change them because they already represent change. Okay. That's kind of. Uh, so how did that happen? And we just talked about this. Observables. We got a. Yeah. So observables. Um, push base, not pull base. That's, that allows us to do the asynchronous stuff. So we're not querying for the clicks. They're coming to us. Okay. You think of observables as streams of events, or objects, or anything over time. Streams of objects, streams of anything, right? But over time. It's not a stream that's happening right now. It's a stream that is open right now, but can give us stuff at any point in the future. Okay. So this is what we do with observables. First thing we do is we subscribe to an observable. At that point, it can start giving us things. It does this via on next? There's an on next function in there that I'll show you. Uh, in fact, this one right here, where this has got the uh, subscribe, 
the first function it's passing in there, that's on next. So whenever we on next a new value, these are going to get called. Okay, on next, on next, do more on next. Maybe it goes on forever. That observable could keep on feeding us though. Like if we if we turn mouse moves into an observable, that's going to keep on going. It's never going to end, right? Until maybe we end the process or whatever. But ideally, it would never end. Or maybe we have an observable that stops at some point. That's going to call on completed. So we're going to keep on getting things up until on completed is called. So we can do stuff with everything that comes across and on completed is called. We can do something when it's done giving us things. Um, example might be we will only want 10 clicks. So we write, hey, you get me the clicks as an observable, take 10, subscribe. And then we can pass the function to for each of those 10 clicks, and the function once it's given us 10 clicks. Okay? Um, errors can also happen. If our, in our mapping function, we end up somehow dividing by zero, which wouldn't matter in JavaScript anyways, but we threw an exception inside of our map, it wouldn't just blow up the entire program, it would just blow up the one observable. And it would give us that information via the on error handler. So if an exception occurs at any point in your observable, it's going to propagate that to you to handle gracefully. Okay? Um, so you don't have to worry about exceptions. And in fact, if you just wanted to ignore exceptions when they happen, you could chain on a retry mm -hmm. extension method, and it would say, oh, I got an exception, so I'm just going to resubscribe and see if it works. You what what kind of exception do you have to get to actually break the observable? Because I, I imagine within your function, mm -hmm. you're saying, you're saying the error happens within that function you wrote for it? Or and it yeah. would, stop, would stop the entire chain if that had an exception? So check this out. All right. So inside that map function, yeah. if at that first line we just threw an exception, throw a new exception, okay. what's happening is the map function is internally wrapping it in a try catch. It's catching it, and then it's sending an error notification rather than propagating that. Right. And my question is, since it's a stream, wouldn't it just be applying to the current um, I guess the current implementation or the current uh, reference of on next because basically like when you, when you I call, yeah, if I call a function a hundred times um, if that function blows up it's just within that one the one piece if I, if I have a try catch wrap around it, right so I'm just curious where where it breaks the chain if you have an exception there it completely stops you through there's ways around that because internally it's using a, a fully qualified notification system. But what it gives you is what's contained inside of the notifications. So we can materialize the stream, so we can get notifications this is an error, this is an object, this is a completed, things like that. Um, that's pretty good <coughs> stuff. But you have a lot of control over it. Maybe this, this explains JavaScript is anyway single threaded. Yeah, so well, so like at any point only one is happening. It just it just right. feels that if they're all happening, but it creates the illusion. It yeah, creates the illusion, but it's only happening. So an error can only happen once. So at a, at a point, it's only at that instance, it's only executing one function. Yeah, so I think once that error happens, I think that. I think what he was saying was the same thing. We haven't seen the the back end implementation of the yeah. exception handling. But if you were literally writing it like this, you had a try catch in there. The try catch would throw an error every time. Oh yeah. So Wait, hold on. So if you if you did a hundred right. and an error yeah. got a two, then you get ninety nine errors. Right. So when that exception occurs, because we're inside of an observable, if an exception occurs and we don't choose to ignore it via some code I could show you, right. um, then it will completely stop that subscription or that like the subscribe creates a subscription. If an exception occurs, it will end your subscription. It will dispose of it. So if you have given indefinite loop inside the observable. Do you have a me mechanism that it will somehow stop the observable? Yeah, it will completely stop it. It's all single threaded. It's it's being asynchronous, but it's all single threaded. So if you get an infinite loop in there, nothing else is going to happen. That's just the nature of JavaScript. Yeah, the, the browser is going to dictate when that time's up. If we, on the other hand, created an observable that represented, um, it, I'm sorry, if we had created an observable that never ended, but yielded, say, every millisecond even, then we might be able to do asynchronous processing in an infinite loop without actually having an infinite loop. Right? Yes? Can you can use the return of a uh, simple put in uh, plus b in where the exception comes from just a or b 
or it could come from <coughs> also. So basically, my right. question is because you see it should be basically uh, just depend on the change of A, a or B. So yeah. So so it depends on how you set up, obviously. So if if you were computing A and A through an exception, and C was dependent on A, C would receive an exception from A, and then it would say, oh, I got an exception. So somewhere along the line, I can't work anymore. So it's the same exception. Same. It'll be the same object, but both that, that stream will. Because I guess my question is, so we are actually listening to A and B. C. Yeah. If we three. yeah, if we subscribe to C because C is dependent on A and B, we're subscribing to A and B mm -hmm. and C. But it's doing those subscriptions internally for us. So if we decided to split, dispose of our subscription to C, it would automatically stop listening to A and B as well. Which is kind of a debate <coughs> topic. So uh, it gets into <coughs> cold observables and hot observables. Unless we are subscribed to something, that observable is cold, which means it's not actually doing anything processing. Unlike in Knockout, where its dependency tracking system is constantly updating and tracking everything, no matter if we're using it or not, right? Well, in a push-based system like this that's lazy, where we have to be subscribing to something, it won't do any processing that it's not actually going to end up using. Um, forgot where I was, kind of, sort of, guys. All right, so subscribe. Some stuff comes across. Maybe it goes on forever. Maybe it stops. Maybe an exception gets thrown somewhere within our subscription chain. And if it does, it will end our subscription and notify us of that, uh, of that error. But if we appended the retry method at the end of it, then it would just resubscribe the whole thing again, however many times we wanted to. Okay. The other thing we can do is manually dispose of something. Okay. So this stream may go on forever, but we just choose to stop listening to it maybe halfway through it's done, or 10 seconds into it being done, or maybe even we just want the first three items. It could go on and give us more and more items, but we only want the first three, and we can just stop listening. We do that via dispose. So we can dispose of a subscription at any time. Um, and like I said, that will make all of the other observables go cold. So what can we do with uh, what can we do with observables? We can create them, obviously. Uh, we have to be able to create them and use them. We can compose them, like I was talking about. If C is dependent on A and B, we can compose C in such a manner that anytime A or B updates, it'll automatically update C. Um, we can listen to them, that's a subscribe, and then we can react to them. Reacting to them is our side effects. In functional programming, the idea of a side effect is stuff has to change eventually. A side effect is things changing. Um, or, yeah, so let's get into a little bit of actual reactive extension stuff now. Uh, some of the stuff we can do. So I think we may have seen, we saw an example of map, but this is what map does. So we see at the top, that's our source, and the bottom is our destination. So is everybody familiar with how I kind of showed this as our, our stream of information coming across as an observable? All right, so it flows, time is from left to right. Each individual circle is a unique piece of information, a number, an event, okay? So here we've got four different, four different items that come across and then we're mapping it via this lightning function, right? So let's say we get four colors, we map it via a lightning function, well now we have a new stream of events that is just a lighter version of the other stream of events. So we can take this one stream, or we can take this one observable and turn it into a better observable. We can take events and turn them into better events, stuff that we can actually consume, stuff we need, right? Let's do... Hey, that's cool. Flashes. By the way, this looks way cooler on my screen. It's just the light. The light. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty smooth. It's ESS3 transitions and stuff. But, uh. <laughs> All right. So, observable map. Pretty self-explanatory. N is a specific number. N squared is a specific number. N to the third is a specific number. And those are three distinct observables. So let's look at this example here. Down here, <coughs> that's all of our code that, uh, that's basically our view, if you will, if you want to call it that. That's all the stuff that happens. That's all of our side effects. That's how we're manipulating the DOM according to all these events that we set up, right? And then up here, we actually have these events. So our number is a timer that starts immediately, that's at zero, and then every 500 milliseconds, it sends another event. Doesn't really matter what that event is, but in 
this case it's just one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Then we select or map, same thing, select and map, uh, pseudonyms, a new random number, okay? N new random integer. Okay, and then square is simply, this publish, I'll get to it in a second. Um, square is just number map, uh, it's just number map square, right? It's the square of the number. It's kind of hard to explain when you, when you look at it, when you read it so often, it's like, well, that's just the squares, right? So this is the square of that number. And then the cube represents an observable that is, or represents the changes. Uh, cube is the number mapped into cubes, right? So in three lines, or well not three lines obviously, but in a few lines we've created three separate observables that represent the changes over time of um, one number mapped in two different ways. Okay. And down here, we create our elements to display them using jQuery. So just in case anybody doesn't know, this is the jQuery object or function. We're creating a new div and we're pinning it to the body. And we're storing that div inside of number and then inside of the cube inside of uh, square down here. So we subscribe to number, and any time the number changes, we set the value to this guy. That's all the way down there, is it right? Is that, is that number dot connect, is that like the uh, knocked out apply binding? Is that what you're doing? That no, no, no. I'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so we're just subscribing. So all of this stuff down here is our side effects. We've clearly separated our observable logic, our event manipulation and stuff uh, up here. Notice how everything up here doesn't change. It represents changes. That's functional reactive stuff. And then down here is all of the side effects. So if we wanted to go and completely get rid of all of the features, not do any processing, we can save that and come back to where we should be now, but we're not, and then it's gone. And for the record, none of that code is actually running right now. It is, but because it connects. Um, but that was our entire feature. We didn't break anything by getting rid of the view, if you will. We could go in and delete that, and it didn't affect our actual logic up here. So you asked about what um, connect and publish is, or connect down here and publish. If we did this, if we got rid of those two guys, we ran this, it wasn't right. Is that right? Okay, the reason why is because we subscribe to a random stream of events three times. Okay, we have three distinct timers running in the background. And they're all being mapped. Or, sorry, <coughs> it's as if I did this. Okay, three timers. Okay, because when we subscribe, we subscribe to the entire event chain. It creates a new timer every time we subscribe. To prevent that, we have to publish it, which creates a connectable observable and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's kind of complex, um, I guess. But anyway, so we connect to it, which means, hey, subscribe now. And anybody else who subscribes, just give them the subscription that's already running. Or funnel that stuff through to, it's like multicasting, if that makes sense. So if you leave it exactly as it is, take off the connect, what does it show? If I did that, nothing. The reason why is because I didn't actually subscribe. So we've got three subscriptions going on, right? But they're subscribing to something that isn't changing. Because I haven't connected it to. It's the same thing. I'm if, if you go back to the code, uh, numbers actually be observable via the statue. Okay. okay, so those two yeah, are all I didn't see that part. So together? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, right. So we publish it, and then we have to connect it. Because we don't necessarily want to turn it on right now but we want people to be able to listen to it for when we do turn it on. Um, I'm sorry for having put that in that example because it's the first code example I've given you and I had to put publish in there because I was mapping in three different ways. Uh, so, sorry about that. So, map. So, how did I get there? Okay, so we have our source stream of events and we've mapped it into a better stream of events by lightening it because we always needed that for some reason. We needed lighter events. Um, filter and where, uh, have you guys heard of filter or where, like if you're using unique or anything like that? Okay, 
So basically what happens is we have this stream of events at the top, okay, 3, 13, negative 9, and the destination stream at the bottom is the original stream, but only the elements that are less than 5. Okay, so we're doing some filtration there. Um, notice how 13 is not less than 5, so it doesn't end up in this new stream of events. Okay, so if it's greater than, if it's less than 5, it's definitely going to end up in the new stream of events. If it isn't, it's not. You can probably use that for validation and things like that in the future and get more complex. You guys are actually interested in this one. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have an example of filter aware. No, I don't. But I do have an example of finish. No, you know. I don't have an example of finish, but I can make one. Next slide. So merge. Okay, what if we've got two separate stream of events? We need to merge those into one stream of event. Okay. What if if we describe to the if we subscribe to the moves of the mouse, what if it gave us distinct x and y events? But we wanted to get we wanted to get the event that was wait, this is wrong. This is totally different. Okay, so what if we what if we've got clicks coming from a button on the top left hand corner and a button on the top right hand corner? Okay, usually we'd write code to say, hey, go uh, go select the button on the top left hand corner and then do this thing. Okay. And then go subscribe, or anytime it's clicked, do this thing. And then anytime the button on the top right hand corner is clicked, do this thing. And our code would look like that. We'd have duplicate code, right? Or we could take the events from the top left hand corner button and the top right hand corner button, merge them into its own event stream, aka the requests a page refresh stream, right? And then subscribe to that. And we know that anything that comes across that stream is definitely requesting a page refresh. We could add as many buttons as we want. We could have any other kind of logic going into that. And anytime we get an event from that stream, we know that that's what it's trying to do. Does that make sense? Can you give like a real world example of that merge? Mm. Okay. Like a real world example as in like physical objects? Well, something, a website, or something that would use this. Think of a cart example. Hmm? Shopping cart example. A shopping cart example. It's a little bit more complex than I can write up in two minutes. Well, you don't have to write it up, just explain it. Just how, like, an add to cart button, you could have multiple different buttons that they all add to the cart. Oh, like sure. You want them to do the same thing. Right, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the NVDM DOM binding example, right? Let's say we have an observable or a subject in this case that represents all of the requests for putting something in a cart. Let's say there's multiple ways of putting something in a cart. Okay, there's the add to cart button, which would add one item to the cart, right? Well then let's say there's also um, an input box where you can say, let's put 10 items in the box. So when you press enter, it adds 10 items to your cart, okay? That sounds very similar. One instance, we're adding one item. The other instance, we're adding 10 items. But they're two distinct events. Why don't we why don't we say when the button is pressed, we select the number one, okay, and that's one of our observable. And then when we press enter, when our input is selected, we check to see if the contents can be converted to a number. And if it can, then we convert it to a number. And that's another observable. So now we have an observable that represents the button press to add to the cart and the input to add 10 items to the cart, or any X number of items. We merge those, we subscribe to that one uh, observable, and then we say, hey, this is the observable that tells us how many items to add to the cart. But it doesn't necessarily just have to be a number, it could actually be items, actual objects. We have to provide a function for each of the original. Right, you're gonna have to subscribe to you're going to have to subscribe to them either way, right? You're going to have to subscribe to the button press, and you're going to have to subscribe to pressing enter on the input. And you're going to have to do the parsing uh, to get a number out of it. And then you're going to have to call a function to do all that stuff anyways. But what ends up happening is you, you, you end up making all of your event handling code dependent on your business logic. You're binding your events to your business logic, which doesn't create a clear separation of responsibilities, right? So if we can compose the, the button press and the enter button into an observable, a distinct object that is not dependent on your business logic, right? And then we can subscribe to that. Now we've created this 
clear distinct separation of responsibilities between the UI and our business logic. So I think that's Can you do something like that for AV audio row? Timeline A is a, a sound, and B is a sound, and you're merging them. You, 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 I mean, maybe audio roll. Uh, I'm not familiar with that terminology. I'm not either. I mean, just, you know, like, uh, I, I, I think about would, for audio editing or something like that. Uh, for audio editing. Uh, basically, let's say you have a voice, right, and you had a soundtrack, and you wanted to merge the voiceover with the soundtrack and export a combined file that has right. the, the voiceover and the soundtrack together. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the, 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 the problem being is is sound audio files are not data sets. I mean, they're, they're data sets, but yeah. they're not math variables. Yeah. They're not distinct. <coughs> uh, audio files are mathematical. If we, if, if for instance, we had a waveform that looked like this, and we sampled it like this. Okay, so we have a point here, and a point there, and a point here, and a point there, and a point here, and so on and so forth, right? <coughs> and then the other one went the exact opposite way, right? And then what should happen is they should cancel each other out, right? But if we were to merge them, what would happen is we'd have a point here, and a point here, and a point here, and a point here, and, a point here, and so on and so forth. And we'd end up with this weird static sound. So merge takes, <coughs> merge takes a stream of events, two stream of events, or any number of stream of events and merge them all into one. It's like we've got 10 different faucets pouring into the same funnel and they all end up being <coughs> one stream of water. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 10 what different sources mm -hmm. all pushed into the same So thing. is this, are you gonna have less lines of code with, with the merge and with your two um, functions? Or is it just basically making it uh, more easier? Complicated. Um, it doesn't necessarily make it easier. What you're going to end up with is when you go back to read your code, it's going to end up being much more explicit. How, how often is this used? I mean, like we're spending a ton of time on it. Yeah. And I feel like it's one of those things that's there that we're probably never going to use. It's like a very edge case but, scenario. But, uh, so can we like go on? I think that the, the business case. Are you talking about merge specifically? Yeah. Okay. The business case there drives the merge, right? If you if you're treating treating two distinct sets of events uh, in the same manner for business case, then you use the merge. But I think you're completely right. I mean, that's a decision you make based upon your method of treatment. Right. Right. And, and if you find that you've got a lot of repetitious treatment, you combine the two. So I think it's it's a personal preference. It's not that it is a business case. So, so merge and filter and map and zip and group by, which is way more advanced. Those are all tools. The reason I'm showing them to you is to show you some of some of the tool belt. Yes. I guess the overall big picture of this is like the functional is sort of like a classical score. Like if you had, let's say, a string quartet where everybody has their score and they play their certain parts and you know it all it's all in harmony in quotation marks. Whereas this seems to be more of a jazz trio. Whereas you have a piano player, you have a drummer, and you have uh, a bass player, mm -hmm. and right. you're playing off fragments. Right. But well, you don't, you never, you can't in, in anticipate anything. You don't know what the trumpet player is going to do. You react to what the trumpet player is doing in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so from a musical standpoint, you're listening. Oh, he went down an octave. He decided okay. to go here. So if we do jazz, then I, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my beat or I'm gonna change, right. and it's a reactionary process as right. opposed to a predefined school. Right. Is is I think what yeah. you're trying to say. Yeah. So it's That's an analogy it. to what you're talking about with regard to reactive. I I, I think that is because you can't define what that trumpet player is going to do because right. he may not even know right what he's doing. So he's just doing it in the moment. Mapping and merging and zipping and all sorts of different kinds. <laughs> with our tool belt to be able to get this stuff to all work together asynchronously in the way that we want. Right, mm -hmm. which is jazz. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jazz is the hardest kind of music to make, right? Because if you do it wrong, it ends up being terrible, and if you do it right, everybody's just like, yeah, this is great. Right? you got to be in sync, though. That's that's yeah, the exactly. beauty of what you're talking about. Yeah. you got to yeah. be listening, so anticipating. Talking about getting in sync, no, it's not a picture of in sync, don't worry. Congratulations, Thomas, you album. Um... So zip, we're trying to get in sync, right? Okay, so we've got two 
distinct observable sets. Okay. And these guys are. Sorry. I'm done, guys. Um, we have two distinct observables, okay? And a time is happening from left to right, okay? This stuff, that stuff over there is happening in the future, this stuff is happening now, progressing like this. This happened, okay? And now this happens, but what we need is an object that is a combination of both of them, right? We need to zip them together. So we have an observable happening here, an observable happening here, and we zip them together, just like a zipper. Except, in this case, we have a temporal flux in our zipper. So this zipper is spaced out differently than this zipper. And so zip helps to bring each of them together like this. Well, you know what that is, don't you? Like, is that a scan lines on old analog TV? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because what happens is essentially, and this is, when you're watching old analog TV, it basically chops up one part of an image and it mixes this with the even lines from an odd line from the next image. And then it follows. Right, that's interlacing. So yeah. that's what happens when you watch old analog TV. But interlacing has a one to one. Does this have a one to one? This has a one to one. It, it's required, so if you have three of these in a row, what happens? So if the They're pending. They haven't met their match yet. So, so it'll go back to the first B that queued up? If 100 A's fire off and then yeah. one B fires off, we take that first A. Okay. Right. Match is then off. Yep. And does it match only two of them? Zip, I believe, takes only two. two. Okay. If you wanted to use more than that, combine zips. Sure. Yes. Combine zips. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. I haven't actually tested that case. I mean, I've only tested it for two observables. Maybe it does take a larger one of them, but I don't really see a use case for that at this point. I'm sure there is one where you could create one. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. You guys care enough to go look at source code and find that out right? <laughs> um, well, for all these things, what I'm thinking of is one of the conferences we're doing is accessibility. And so it's talking about uh, helping out where you can provide data for hearing impaired or vision impaired people. And so these are the things that I'm thinking may offer solutions in JavaScript and HTML5 to add data to existing data that could be that could be pulled out for, for disabled people, right? I, I mean, just theoretically, unless I'm totally getting this thing wrong, is you could combine data, let's say, um, you know, scripts, right? A and you could say along points of time, if you're watching a video and you have a script that, uh, attached to that video that's in JavaScript and you have that transcript uploaded that at a particular point in time, right, you could get that text string to play along with the, the video or audio file. I'm going to say you can do that, definitely. Mm -hmm. But it involves schedulers. Right. So right now, everything that I showed you is working off of the schedule, like the now scheduler. Okay. So as time progresses, it's in real time. Mm -hmm. So this stuff, as it happens, is going to happen, right? Well, what if we recorded stuff that we know is going to happen at some offset in the future? Um, and it, this is not the scope of this presentation, but sure. schedulers is a big part of reactive extensions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so if we, if we wanted to, yeah, if we wanted to write a, if we wanted to write a scheduler that could act as a scrubber for a timeline, right. okay, we can totally do that. So we have these observables that represent each portion of your timeline, each track on your timeline. You can create a scheduler to scrub across it. Totally possible. Totally possible. I don't know how the backtracking and then scrubbing again would work necessarily, but I'm sure you can do it. <coughs> What is uh, <coughs> sounds like, or is it similar to a state state machine, like a truth table? That events happen if um, logical, true, false. It uh, tells you what events. That's another style of uh, programming is uh, rules based, mm -hmm. and it's very powerful. Yeah, I mean that's how that's how modern day compilers work, right? So they use so, it. and as opposed to if it else. Uh, right. Actually, did a business rules programming for GTE directories that um, allowed them to solve the problem that they tried. <coughs> it's factorial. Anything that's factorial comes up with um, could be a thousand states, and you just can't do if then else programming with um, with that. 
<coughs> number of events. So this sounds kind of like it when it comes in with the uh, depend on and then uh, really functional <coughs> programming as um, <coughs> going back to back us an hour. It was one of the um, actually I think inventor of func functional programming in the original like seventies. Yeah, and this, this really stems directly from functions that. are true false, uh, which is really what you what you get in, uh, in uh, any kind of function. That, so it's, it's it kind of all merges together, but um, it's it's certainly not a uh, procedural program. No, no. Um, for anybody that. Um, doesn't know procedural programming, comparative programming, uh, like we're calling functions all the time and we're manipulating state to get what we want, right? So we've got this state management problem and how we solve that in the functional world is we don't have state at all. And if we do, it's, we're passing it on to whoever needs to use it next. So like um, <coughs> recursion, it involves state manipulation. Like we have to add to the stack, right? Okay, and there's there's manipulations of a state going on there. So every time we recurse into the function, more is added to the stack, and eventually what we end up with is a stack overflow. Mm -hmm. Stack overflows don't happen in functional programming unless you use a pending okay? because it's got something called scale recursion, mm -hmm. which means it's done doing what it's doing. It took its state with it, and because we're not changing anything, because it's all new stuff, we can pass that state onto the next call function. We're not adding any new things to the stack. It can run forever, or until it decides to stop running and then return that evaluated, or that value, or whatever, to whoever called it. Um, I don't know how I got on that. But, um, so, let's look at something a little bit more advanced. <coughs> group by. So, if you guys are familiar with SQL statements, all right, so we want to group these by a certain thing or whatever, right? Well, that works for data that we already have, we can select stuff and group it if we already have it. That's very easy, right? We just look over and we're like, oh, we're going to group by this heat. But what if we don't have it yet? What if we want to set up a query for the future? Okay. What if we're getting a bunch of information and we need to group it by um, some key or something, and we need to be given an observable that represents the future values that are going to come across for this key? Okay. And so what group by does <coughs> is say source is a list of names, for instance, Alfred, Bruce, and Batman, right? And then we're going to group by the first character in the name. So if this is our if this is our source observable, our destination observable ends up yielding a new observable. Okay, which represents everything that starts with A. And then down here we got something that starts with B. So it's like, oh, we're also grouping by B. Okay, I'm going to give you an observable that represents everything that's grouped by B. So then if another A came, it would it would be right. tended to A. Yep. Um, so you see Bruce, it created this observable and then pushed Bruce onto that observable. Right? Well, that <coughs> can, he starts with B2, so down there to the B group. Okay? And the important part to note is that we didn't know Batman was going to be in the B group because he hadn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. But we gave you an observable to represent it being in the future and put that in down there for you. And, and the arrival of Bruce started a new group. Because he was the first thing that started with B. But it did start a new group. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very cool. So we have a C yet. Let's look at so an you example. don't have a C yet, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. let's look at an that's example of that. That's very cool. This is happening asynchronously, just looking back. So we're generating a random number, 0 through 4, right? W, C, 0 through 4. So the first number that happened was 0. <laughs> the second number was 4. Yeah, when you restart that, let's see, see, this sure. it start building. Yeah. Here, let's see. I don't know if you guys can. Well, that one there was a little delay before four showed up. There was a delay, yeah. Yeah, there definitely was. And it's, I think it's this computer. Well, oh, this one. All right. So let's see this. Yeah. Anybody can see that. Mm -hmm. I can also slow it down. It's on set to a timer right now that runs every 200 milliseconds. But. Right. Yeah. That's probably good. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. We're doing a group by for stuff in the future. Ooh, it's time travel. Not really. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's generating a random number, and it's automatically sorting that into observables. And since we're listening to the observables and we're appending stuff, um, that's what it ends up looking like. Let's take a look at the actual code for this. Um, if nothing else, tonight is about thinking. Functional programming makes you think in different ways. Okay, um, that's that's one of the things I really like. But 
you're right. right. There's a lot of graphical implications for this type of there is. program. So let's look at how build it real time chart. Yeah, let's look at how much code this took. Okay. The groups is the timer that executes every 100 milliseconds, and then we map or select a random number from zero to five. Oh, zero to four, sorry. Um, and then we group it by that number. Okay. So groups is going to be all of our groups. And we can subscribe to that. <coughs> First we create this big number at the top, right? This is what this is. So that is not that, that's the big number at the top. Okay. And then we subscribe to groups. And then every time we get a new group, this function is going to get called, right? So we create a new div to represent everything that's going to be contained within that group. And we append it to the body. Then we subscribe to the group, kind of like Inception. Okay, we go a level deeper now. <laughs> we have a two-dimensional array of observables. I know I took you from like not knowing what an observable was in JavaScript to now going two dimensions. That's crazy, but bear with me. Um, so we subscribe to that group. So in our case, it's going to be zero. All of the zeros that happen as they come across. And so every time a zero happens, we're going to flash. We're going to flash the new number that comes across, right? That's what that flash class thing is. Um, and then we're going to append a new span to the group, which our spans are single mm -hmm. non-length. Our spans are the little dots. So for touch technology, you can essentially have four bar charts, touch one, and manipulate one of the bars and have the corresponding charts react to the other bars react to the movement of the table mm -hmm. bar. Right. If you're looking data and you say, hey, what happens if our sales volume goes down mm -hmm. to this level, how is that going to affect all this other data? I mean, in an interactive chart. Is that, or am I just... Let me, let me say, let me start with this. I didn't understand the question, but okay. React Extension is definitely okay. more, or more, right now, React Extension is definitely more sort of, uh, suited towards views and stuff like that. So doing, doing that, um, having new data come down, grouping it, putting it on the screen, and then hooking in new observables to the app and manipulating that data, just like you're getting real-time information, Rx is perfect for that kind of thing. It sounds good. I mean, it sounds like you're saying it would work. Yeah. You're, you're just manipulating, you're just changing the value of whatever that bar is, and the other ones can be observing what the value will be. Right, I mean, for CEOs and presentations, being able to, you know, touch your computer and, and drop down What'll the bar. If this value's here, then the other bars grow, or they you have yeah. your subscribers. So the person I, the person who got me really interested in this, um, name's Paul, that's what he does for a living. He's a contractor specializing in using Rx, functional reactive programming, to create that kind of application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so creating applications where everything's highly responsive, highly reactive, you're getting real time information coming down, streaming to you. That's what he's doing. <coughs> that's why he went this route. That's why he's using Rx. Right. Because what I've heard in the sphere is that actual HTML5 on mobile devices is slow as molasses. No. 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 Yes. 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 Trust me. If you just have HTML5 on <laughs> mobile devices, just HTML5. HTML5 is semantic, so you're saying just putting aside tags and There's HTML5, there's a book, a new book called HTML5 for mobile, okay. and I, I'm an Adobe community professional, so I get insider info on some of this stuff. And um, the, the authority on mobile just came out, and his thing was, dude, if you're just using HTML, if you're not using jQuery or any of these other things. Well, well, what I'm saying though is, are you, are you talking <laughs> about CSS3? Or, I mean, HTML5 is only semantic. It's just Yeah, that's just, right. just a markup. Right. It's just the markup. And it implies a lot of this stuff because we get Canvas with it. And we get yeah, Canvas could be and slow. And CSS3 kind of goes along with, along with it, right? Transforms could be slow. Yeah, yeah, but HTML5 is just, just HTML. HTML. Yeah, you're look up, if you're on Amazon, look up HTML5 for mobile. Okay. And, and you look up the guy's name. I'm just, I'm just running. He's like badass. I forget his name, of course, but uh, he's a badass HTML5 developing just for mobile for Neil Kia and some of those other people. He said, "Man, it's it's slow. It's slow, slow, slow." You might want to check out um, All right. the Sitepoint book, HTML or mobile development for. Uh, 
depends what you're trying to do. Do you want, do you want an application that is as snappy and responsive as a native? Sure. If that's what you want, yes. you're correct. You do not want HTML5. Right. If you want a, a good, robust, rich interface, right. you're not worried about the you know one millisecond response time, then HTML5 is fine. HTML5 embedded in a native application is terrible, but that's totally off topic. Oh, yeah. So can we get back to Chris? Yes. I will say real quick that if we're using <coughs> HTML5 stuff, processors are going to get faster. HTML5 changes are going to get, we're going to get stuff that's running that stuff faster. But if we're programming native stuff or if we're rolling our own solutions to try and make things faster, it's just going to be slow in the future. If we use standard stuff and we just continually update stuff, we're going to have a lot more developers who know how to do that more quickly, right? And because it's a standard. People are going to be developing this way, but they're going to try and make that stuff faster. So in the future, that's not necessarily going to be true. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, we have next meetup where Corey yeah. is going to be here. He actually ran like almost 35 flops in the last uh, erotic game in 3D, and he showed to us. I think it will be a good conversation for the next meetup. Cool. All right. Okay, so back to this real quick. I mean, it's kind of a complex example. We've got we've got real time asynchronous stuff coming across. We've got a random number, and it's being sorted. Okay, into new groups. Okay, we're creating new views for each group that's coming across. That could be that could be anything that could be serialized into a unique thing, right? It could be a person's name and all of their tweets. Okay, we're giving new tweets and be like, oh, we get a new group of tweets, so we create a new view for that tweet, and we funnel all those tweets into this view, right? Okay, and how many lines of code did it take to do this example? And okay, and what clear separations and possibilities do we have here? We've got our grouping and our, our business logic basically up here. This is just an example, so we don't have real business logic in it, but it's our business logic basically. And then we have our view down here for our business logic. Or we have our view, okay? If you read this, let's read this, okay? Groups equals timer for every 100 milliseconds. Um, mapping to map.floor, map.random times five, which you can say is a random value. So every 100 milliseconds we get a random value, and we group it by that. So now we have groups based off of that. If we did that without using functional programming, and in this case because it's synchronous, functional reactive programming, our code would be much harder to read. We would be dealing with the state management on our own because we're not using a reusable tool set to do it. Okay? And we wouldn't have this clear separation of responsibility because we are smart programmers and we always like to do things right when they happen. So we end up you know, creating our our divs and stuff up here, which would be completely messing with our responsibilities, right? Um, and if you increase the written number to a thousand, you don't need to change code. No, no change, no changing of code. In fact, yeah. So let's change it to a hundred real quick. I haven't entered my. We're gonna solve my operating system last week, so I haven't entered stuff. So change it to a hundred. That's the order in which the numbers are coming across, mm. and that's the number of times it's actually appeared. Let me scroll down. Yeah. Let's take a look at. Or this. does it have any internal 
functionality. Internal functionality? Yeah, from the new grid. What are you going to subscribe to? Is it a timer? Yeah. So, so well, in this case, it's a timer, but it's a timer that's designed to go get, um, oh, sorry. do an API request to Flickr, and then turn each individual image load into its own observable, which will get yielded. So an observable that represents an image after it's loaded, right? So this is just streaming out images that were definitely loaded. From I mean, these are these are literally the latest images from Flickr. Let me show you a good word. Um, and then, and then uh, you can tell me if that's what you're talking about or not. <coughs> so latest. Here we've got some functions doing some things. Um, probably don't need this function, but I'm gonna leave it in there. Anyways. So this function get latest photos as observable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right here we've got get JSON as observable, which is built into our XGS jQuery. We give it the URI. Okay. And it's a pretty public API. We don't have to do anything special like create a, create a code and whatnot. Um, we just have to give it, yeah, it's easy. So, um, And then we do select mini. So like before where we were doing map or select, we can use flat map or select mini here to say that, hey, what I'm giving you back is an observable. And instead of yielding that observable on your stream, merge the events that come across on that observable into the original stream. Does that make sense? So that's, that's an instance where merge would make sense. Um, but is it possible to subscribe to the web socket event? You com by com combine this two, you use web socket, yes. and listen to something, but then you combine with the subscribe. So I, you can right. just keep listen to anything happening in the web. Yeah, I mean, if I had an extra hour today, I would have gotten it set up with the Node.js sure, example. Yeah. That's one of the things I wanted to do today. I just did not have time to do it. Um, it's basically just wrap a and like socket IO or whatever that library is uh, yeah. in an observable and then treat that as hey everything coming down from the IO pointer for what? Is there any JavaScript to support a functional programming? Because it is big in Java, there's uh, scale up. Right. Java 8 is going to support functional programming. Right. I'm curious uh, on uh, the JavaScript world, how much more support? Yeah, so let's all start with the basics and remember that JavaScript is a dynamic language, first and foremost. And if you're not disciplined, you're going to end up writing something that's functional going back and making it completely non-functional. I mean, you can just completely overwrite everything. I can do document dot equals something or other. You know, in like two versions of a browser go, and be like, I don't know what you're doing. You just completely destroyed me. I'm sure they throw an exception to that stuff now, but um, if I wanted to, I mean, there's nothing stopping me from saying, oh, hey, that is images equals null. Completely non-functional now. In, in both in both ways. One, it doesn't work, and two, it's just not functional because I changed the value. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna some about libraries. But the functional program. Libraries but, right, other yeah. than the Rx ex extension, is there other JavaScript uh, extension yes. which is functional uh, reactive supporting this uh, parody? Par function <coughs> yes. put functional programming parody. Yes. Okay. So, a couple things. I'm going to answer that question real quick. So, two things. One, reactive extensions is asynchronous. Okay. And it's functional. Okay. Um, so, if we wanted something that wasn't asynchronous, we could use interactive extensions, which is kind of the same thing as reactive extensions, but it's it's uh, non. It's synchronous. There we go. That's what we're looking for. So it works right here, right now, for something that we already have, rather than stuff that comes across in the future. Um, so if you wanted a if you wanted a synchronous <coughs> version of React extensions, that's called interactive extensions. That's kind of in development right now. Um, for other functional reactive programming libraries, Bacon JS. Bacon JS. Here's the main difference between Bacon JS and Reactive Extensions. Reactive Extensions has years of development and support from Microsoft and guys with PhDs working on this stuff in several different languages, which means you learn it once. You get it in Ruby, you get it in .NET, you get it in Java now, okay, JavaScript. Learn it once, learn this tool set once, you get at least four different languages. Oh, and it's in native C++. Okay, so you've got several different languages. Uh, and you get cold observables. And you get cold observables in React extensions. You don't get any of that stuff in data. What you get is a guy who went and used React extensions, said, I don't know how to use this, got a bad taste in his mouth, and said, I can do better. Wrote it by himself, and then had the community come in and add stuff. Okay, 
So it, it like, so with knockout.js, everything is tracking and updating all the time, doing all this processing, even if you don't have a view set up for it, it's not actually using that information. Even if nothing's subscribed, it's still doing all the processing. It's because everything's hot all the time. With React extensions, you have cold observable, which means you can set up <coughs> that represents things that can be subscribed to, but it's not doing any of that processing until you subscribe to it, right? Bacon.js is just like knockout in the fact that that processing is always happening all the time. There's no cold observables, there's no laziness to it. So those are the two examples. Um, okay, back to this example real quick. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're running really low on time. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Probably another 10 minutes. Okay. Good. Cool. Um, hopefully you guys are doing this. Um, so this guy right here is basically returning an observable that represents um, We've got get JSON as observable, which means that it's an observable that's going to yield us the result from a get JSON request, right? And we select mini out of that, and select mini is parts of observable up from array, which means hey, this is synchronous, but let's make it asynchronous by putting it into Rx. So we have an array of photos, we're putting that into from array, and then we're selecting mini off of this. So what this returns is a string that represents all of the individual images, right? So we're using that down here. Select many again. So every 100 milliseconds, <coughs> go get the last 10 latest photos from Flickr. Okay, merge them into our observable. Make them distinct by ID, which means don't don't yield them if we already have that ID, right? And then select many, get image for photo as observable. The photo itself, and then the size we want. It's right here. And all it does is it news up an image, an image tag sets the source on it to this big string you have to put together if you mean the great guy. Um, and then says return on image on as observable get tired on as observable load. So an observable that represents the load of this, but select the image. Which means what we get down here is the latest images are just all of the images, all the latest images from Flickr, but only they're the actual tags. Like all of the tags that are the loaded images from Flickr. Which is why when we look at this over here, those images don't display as blocks that haven't loaded images yet. Okay, they've already loaded. It's not being yielded to us until that image is actually loaded into the browser. So you guys can see it's doing that pretty quickly. Essentially, you could do this so from any data. Any data. Okay. Yeah. So it's like it's lazy loading the data, and the point is, is that we're taking an event. In this case, and then it, it's asynchronous, asynchronously loading all of those images. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, it's it's doing so that according to how the browser loads the images. Yeah, we're just listening for when those images are loaded. <coughs> Is that applying any type of uh, flyweight pattern or anything? Or just kind of keep running <laughs> no. the browser runs out <laughs> It's just all the way down here, all the images, oh. and it's been running for quite some time. It's all the way to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the first <laughs> images. That's this is the first images. So right now, the way I've got it set up. But this entire feature, like here's the reusable stuff, right? The get latest photos as verb observable. And then the get image for photo as observable. This stuff is reusable code. The actual feature for doing this is written right here. That's the feature. And how do we read it? I mean, if you know how to read Rx, we're saying, oh, every 100 seconds, select the latest photos as an observable and take 10 of them, right? And then distinct by ID, and then select many of the get images for photo as observable. And those latest images we now know represent the images after they're loaded. We subscribe to it, and then we just append them, and we're done. So the point is, is that it reads like how we would describe what it's doing, rather than reading like how we do it. Make sense? So obviously this part up here is very procedural, maybe non-functional necessarily, but that's that's the point of Rx and React extensions is, or functional programming really, is to write programs in such a way as to where you can go back and read them easily. So. You will put your code on your website, right? Yeah. Taylor? Oh. Yeah. Is he in doubt? 
It's all over the place. Oh. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a contractor oh. slash consultant. Um, he flies everywhere, doing all sorts of stuff with this. Um, he's the rock star developer that you guys hear about that you never see. <laughs> he's a reactive. He's a reactive director. Uh, developer, whenever you need it, he will yeah, show up. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the future, you'll yeah. never know where he'll be. Right, <laughs> right. 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 until right. you yield that money. Like an all state agent. Yeah, that's the Yeah, so that's the question. Yeah, 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 which is just say, let's go get dogs and get 100 of them. Ta-da, we only we got 100 dogs, right? Well, let's just get cats. Okay, cool, that's fine. Buildings. Buildings, that might pull up something weird, right? Somebody said it's going to be Yes. And conceptually tough. 500, probably going to be longer than the buildings. Oh, that's too Boom, 500 bins. All those images are loaded, right? Mm -hmm. They're not waiting for them to load. So they now, can you click on them and go to the original image? I didn't click on them. Well, if you built it. But yeah, I mean, you've got all the data there. So you, like, what you do is uh, you would hook in a. Well, yeah, you could do it. You can just hook in a value or ID or. Okay, number one mistake you make when programming in JavaScript is passing around IDs instead of actual objects. Always yeah. pass around objects because objects are great. It has all the information you need forever. And instead of looking stuff up all the time, just give the person the object or give the code the object, right? So in this case, I would say, um, where are we? Search. Oh, and the cool thing about this, the, the, the point of, let me back up for a second. The point of this search is to show you the combined latest right here. So we're combining the latest tags observable and page observable. So anytime either of them update, and this could be any number of them. But anytime you hear of them update, we create a new object that has both the tags, the current value of tags and the current value of page per page, right? So we're taking the same observable inputs, merging them all into one observable, which represents the changes from any of them, but it caches, basically caches the value from all the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's, instead of splitting a stream out into different observables, this is how we get them all back into one observable. Mm -hmm. um, I totally forgot the question I was just asked. It's basically, uh, I don't How know. How are you getting the images by ID or by some type of value? For example, somebody might name a photo on Flickr dog, but it's really a cat. So how? Oh, yeah, I'm pulling these up by tags. Oh, okay. tag yeah. photos with that. So, yeah, so we combine the latest, we combine, do, 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 combine the latest tags and page, and that gives us our query. We select the search results as observable with our query tags and our per page, and we select the actual image tags out of that, the actual image like element, elements out of that, and that ends up with our results. And every time we get a result, the first item in the result empties the entire rest of the results, and then all the other ones are populated up to the screen. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but if photos would have uh, metadata such as GPS location, is that something that you could potentially put? Yeah. I mean, if Flickr gives it to you, right? Yeah, well, I mean, if Flickr gives it to us, we can manipulate that data in any way we want. React extensions just give us a, gives us a kind of a functional or active approach to doing it. All right. So we can read our code a little better, I think. If you guys can't read this, and I'm totally just talking up a storm here, just go home and never even think about this stuff again. Mm -hmm. But if it makes you think, and it, you know, excites you in any way, and you think this is more legible than going in and managing the state yourself and manipulating stuff, then definitely jump into React extensions because you end up learning a lot of really cool things. Um, and at some point in the future, your employer will probably ask you to do some functional programming. Because <laughs> it's a buzzer. Like that slide of the links? The slide of, with the links on them? Yeah, this one. Flashed it a couple times. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so this is where Rx resides. So the RxJS uh, jQuery, is that just the connector for it, or is it in addition, is it separate from RxJS, or do you need both for the... Totally separate. If you weren't using jQuery, you've also got like a, I don't know, what are the other popular libraries? Fair enough. <laughs> well, yeah, but those other ones that even come close, <laughs> uh, they've got extensions for this. Okay. So it's just the selector stuff. It's the on as observable. Rather than me having to wrap it in my own observable create, 
Okay. I use these on the So just a little add on to the RTS state library. Yes. In fact, it's like 200 lines long, and every line almost looks the same because it's just the same wrapper on everything. So it basically turns the like I mean, jQuery. Yeah. Like if you were going to subscribe to all the button clicks on the page, you do jQuery and then select the button tag and then like unclick as a durable or something like that. Basically, basically, is that what it would be for? On as observable? RxJS jQuery. Combining yeah. something that you're selecting yeah. with jQuery yeah, yeah, yeah. to an observable. Right. Yeah. So if you wanted to turn all the click events that you got via using jQuery to do that, you would use RxJS jQuery. And then you get this function called on as observable rather than just on, which takes a callback. In this case, it basically just wraps it and says, now the callback's just going to create or just going to funnel all this information to an observable for you. That's all that does. So you wouldn't need delegates in this case. Right. And it gives you the ability to change all of your stuff together. Um, last <coughs> point I want to make uh, is that, like, it, going back to the beginning when I was talking about functional programming, functional programming is using functions to find new things in terms of existing things without changing those existing things. Okay. Um, where's the complex example? Our latest thing, right? So, this guy is a thing that represents the changes of a timer. And then this guy is another function that gets called on that original one, create a new thing that represents all the latest photos every second. Okay? And then this is its own unique object. That that represents all the screen's not updating. Thing. Hmm? The screen's not updating? Why is the screen not updating? Okay, so this turns into a distinct object. It doesn't have a callback, right? We only have a callback when we actually subscribe to it. And then this line is affecting this. It's creating a new thing using a function created. <coughs> okay, that's why it's functional, because we're using this object to define a new object using a function. Okay, and then this whole thing turns into its own object that represents something entirely different, like the latest photos from Twitter every ten seconds or every second. And then the next line makes those distinct. That's a unique object that represents all of them but distinct. This one represents the actual image tags created by that, which means I could get rid of any, I could get rid of this line or that line or that line and so on and so forth, and I'd end up with a unique object every time. I wouldn't end up with a broken statement. I'd end up with a unique functional object so that I could subscribe to. I can group them all apart and subscribe to them individually with different stuff. But so, so in summary, before you coded, before you realized this, before you had the conversation with Paul, mm -hmm. right? What can you tell us some of the benefits that you have personally kind of seen out of out of this approach as opposed to how you were programming before? So what are the some it, of the it, main benefits? I mean I, I it's summary it's a summary kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. So it makes me write reusable code. One. Okay. Two, it's more legible than trying to manage that by yourself. Sure. Your actual feature is defined in four lines. It might might make it more difficult to read than different four lines, but four lines all in one place, the actual feature itself. Um, uh, maintainability, because you're reusing code, then you can create your own little um, functions. <coughs> um, as an example, uh, I have a function, like we have this combined latest, which takes individual observables, merges them all together into one, but yields an object that represents every change quality, yeah, like I said. I created one that uses that internally, but it's combined template. And instead of passing it an array of observables to listen to, you pass it an object, and the property on those objects are observables, and it uses the template from that. It uses that as your object. So you say, hey, all of your properties are these observables, but what I really want is I want the flattened version of it every time they update. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that once, and I can use it anyway. <coughs> right. Yeah. Also, add Excel. Even more powerful when you're doing a distributed computing because you don't have to manage the state. Right. That's the big one of the big yeah. draw for the functional. <coughs> for the yeah. Can I also add uh, uh, one more question? Make sure I understand that correctly. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So uh, technically, I can just use the uh, the reactionary in in uh, RS extension, or I can just use a functional part. Right? I mean, because I can just use a functional part even if I don't have a map as a strap. Or I can just use a map as a strap but not using a functional. It, it might, 
understanding? The map and the map and the, the filter and the fed is the function part. And the subscribe is where we're if you, you so want to just use that part. I mean, that, I think that's you just want to use the map and filter, but you want to use it in a synchronous environment. Uh, I mean, because uh, this is a functional reaction, uh, functional reaction, reactionary. But is it part? Is it part for those who I can basically just uh, just use the reactionary basically the event listening, or I just use a functional uh, programming aspect? I know it's yes. most powerful in that. I'm just yes. from the design point of view, it's possible I can just use part of it. Yeah, uh, if I understand correctly. So basically, functional reactive just means asynchronous yeah. functional, yeah. kind of sort of. Okay. You know? okay. So if you wanted a if you wanted a set of functions, utility functions that work in a functional manner, I would suggest going to get underscore mm -hmm. underscore JS. Or if you want to go the Microsoft route on that one, you can pick up uh, interactive extensions, which is asynchronous. It's just synchronous. Okay. It's like link for JavaScript. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say low dash version of fourth of underscore. Okay. Underscore was highly inefficient. Oh, there you go. And well, dash, I, we, we implemented it our, our site, and um, we have a 10 15 percent performance increase in a single page application, just changing from, from underscore to well dash. Uh, they changed a lot of the feature detection and simulation back in part of it, so that it's optimized to a different browser. Mm -hmm. so that's pretty sharp. Well, I could probably sit here and talk about RxJS all night. Um, but I don't think anybody wants to stay here too much longer because here we've got, we all have our little times that we set for ourselves. Yeah. Give you a Twitter account, give your email and all that, probably yeah. people can reach out to you. And yeah, and if you guys have any questions or comments or anything, hey, look, there's all these photos at the beginning that I tried to. Um, <coughs> you probably have this listed right here. <laughs> so, Twitter handle, bottom left, my name, bottom right. I need to also put more information up there. Let me type this out for you guys. <laughs> if you guys want to see that example of the grouping all of the touch stuff asynchronously and all that stuff, you can go to cwgrace.com and see that. And that's multi touch -made. Oh, and by the way, that is going to be its own library. So if you hit my GitHub, That's my GitHub, <coughs> obviously. Um, this, our JS touch, is going to be completely unique. You've got our React extensions for JavaScript. You can add that to it, and you can, I'm going to be updating that. You'll be able to subscribe to those those group of events, each individual for each individual finger. Taps and groups, taps, and switch. grouping by taps, you can get multi touch or multi tap stuff. And I'm going to be adding to that to create this unified cross browser multi-touch interface that you guys can use for you can use and stuff. And hopefully it'll be fast as well as user score. What are some of the other things you built for? What are some of the other things that I've built? Oh, you, you showed the touch example. Are there any maybe contract jobs that you've done that might be more concrete for us? People aren't familiar with so. Not yet. Most of this has been in my spare time thus far. Um, just going to school, man. And I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is this, this is my hobby. The guy. <laughs> I don't get paid for this yet. Um, I could definitely see using something like this with Twitter streaming API or. Um, I've been doing a lot of D3.js. D3? Declarative graphics. Okay, so I'm currently talking to Eric Meyer, who is like, who's functional programming guru, uh, works for Microsoft, PhD guy, uh, PhD in mathematics, so you know he's smart. Um, I'm talking to him currently about possibly doing an internship in like the Netherlands this summer, working on creating a marriage of reactive extensions and D3. Mm -hmm. So. Think about functional reactive. D3. Yeah, because right now, if you want to do anything with real time data, you basically have to just pull JSON data, or yeah. JSON endpoint. You can't actually subscribe to like a, a web socket. Yeah. I mean, there's a way that you could, I guess you could. And you, but you have to format socket. that into, into a document. Right. And then push that document to D3 every time. Right, right. But if that stuff was just streaming into the existing right. document and being updated. Yeah, because it's already got yeah. um, you know, selections and joining data with the declaration of the graph. Yep. Yep. So RxJS and D3 are like a match made in heaven, but they, they still need that bonding time, which is hopefully what I'll be doing this summer. Exciting. 
Anyway, there was a question, and I got I, I was doing something. Oh yeah. Okay. Other stuff you've done. Last one little thing using bad typing skills. Uh, I don't know if I showed you this or not. How am I? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> this is an object-oriented programming and reactive functional programming combined. So we're, we're housing each of these little nodes in an object, aka object-oriented programming, right? And then we're also separating it into its own view. This is HTML5 canvas. We've got a view, and we've got we've got a model, and the model contains Rx stuff talking to each other. So you can, if you were to visualize it, the lines in between them would be Rx connections, and then the individual nodes would be the objects of object-oriented programming, right? And separation of responsibility between our model view and controller stuff. In this case, we're not using the controller, we're using RX for our logic. Okay? Anybody played Minesweeper? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. This is not your average Minesweeper. So it mm -hmm. should work a little better than that. Let me see. Boom. So it's just a little game. That's all. And we'll tell you if you lose and stuff. It's just as I lose. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's my but it's not grid based. We're not doing index lookups. We're using relationships between nodes and saying, "Oh, hey, are you a mine?" Right? But the reactive stuff comes in from the fact that we don't know where the mines are until we click. Because in a good minesweeper game, you don't place the mines anywhere around the first click, right? So you have to wait until that click happens, then populate the mines. And when the mines populate, the nodes around them are listening and saying, "Oh, you're a mine now." So I'm going to increment my my mine count.